It's Sophie for Culture Compass and today I'm here with Tonya Lacey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. Very good. Now you've been on One Extra a lot lately yeah. and you've released samples for your EP. What's yeah. what's the response been like? Has it been encouraging for you? It has been, um, definitely. I've got a lot of uh, good feedback so far and uh, the EP's only 3.49, which is an absolute bargain. bargain. Yeah. Totally. And um, we've had a lot of... Um, a lot of great um, responses, especially from uh, people like Soul Culture, who have exclusives um, on on certain tracks of the EP. So we've been we've been putting out a little bit, a little test, tasters here and there, and yeah, so far it's going down really well. Now you've described the EP as almost like a bite-sized teaser for what the album will be like. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, do you, would you say you found your sound by honing what you do on the on the EP? Do you say? Yeah, I think uh, finding finding your sound as an artist takes time, and um, the EP basically is uh, is a it's me where I am right now and where I where I want to push music for myself as an artist. So it's definitely like a bite sized version of my album, but I'm still evolving. So um, I'm and I'm still in the studio. So there's there are more tracks to come. Would you say like anything is possible, like any genre could happen for you, even like maybe a taster of opera, like is anything open? I like to, yeah, I like to work without boundaries um, and the, the fact that I'm able to songwrite for other people allows me to, um, to delve into different styles of music, it's music that I may not be the face of, but it is, it's fun to be able to experiment with different types of music for myself i think i know exactly where i'm where i'm happy um with 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 going at the moment but you know you never know music that's the great thing about music where would you say you are most comfortable what sort of style is where you think it just comes more naturally perhaps for me i'm i'm naturally a, a soulful r&b old school hip-hop um, kind of girl. I love my ragga and reggae as well. So my music is a, a mixture of those different mu different types of music, sort of infused together. I've heard you say that before that you might be kind of stuck in the '90s a bit, like you liked your Missy Elliott, yeah, the Al Alanis love, Morissette, that, all that. Yeah, I mean, I do love I do love current music as well. But I think it's important as an artist to know your strength and to know uh, your own identity, and and that's who I am. I, I that's the music I grew up listening to. And the music that you know instantly takes me back to uh, good memories and stuff. So I think naturally I kind of delve towards the the nineties kind of uh, R and B sound. But I'm still evolving, so you know. Who knows? Who knows? I could be doing like death metal. I quite <laughs> like that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got it. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you're in Bristol, obviously it's known for Massive Attack, Portishead, Tricky, yeah. and all that sort of thing. But did it infuse your sound then, or did you actually realise that's not what I want to do from being in that place? Um, I think the Bristol music scene definitely um, influenced me in terms of, uh, I think, the drum and bass aspects, because it was around me and, and a lot of the gigs I did, a lot of the support I did was um, based around drum and bass music. That definitely um, played some part in um, just inspiring me musically. But I knew that that wasn't all I, was, all I had to offer. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I took the inspiration from that, but I still stuck to what I do, which is, you know, more of the ragga, soul, hip hop, R and B, pop. Yeah, I think while you were in Bristol, you were in bands. So yeah, uh, you've mentioned that your nickname's been a trouble. Was it troublemaker? Yeah, troublemaker. And and you have problems with authority and maybe yeah. taking on things. So did you know from your time in the band that that wasn't for you? That you needed to be a solo artist? Um, it was becoming more apparent, sort of halfway through the, my my time in the band, that I definitely wanted to experience um, going out there as a solo artist. Which was a big bold move because um, this was a band that I grew I grew up with, and um, the first band I went on the road with. So, yeah. But I always knew that I, at some point I was I was going to break away. In terms of working with producers, then how are you if they say, look, I don't like that or what you've done there? Are you good at taking that on, or is it usually a bit of a struggle, a bit of a debate? I will fight for something that I really believe in. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I understand that when you're creating something with somebody else, it's about compromise. And um, I do respect the opinions of the people that I work with. So it's, you know, if, if, if I believe in something, I will fight it to the death. But if I do think that they've got a valid point, I'm going to compromise. You know, at the end of the day, they're putting in their opinion for the best of the, for the greater good. So I take that on board.
Do you have a preference when it comes to producers in terms of their style? Because some are absolute taskmasters and really push the artists. Others like yeah. it to be kind of a chilled environment. What's better for you, do you think? Um, when I'm writing, it's, it's cool when it's chilled. Um, when I'm cutting vocals and when, when, it's, you know, when it's getting down to business, I like to be pushed. Um, I, like to, I like producers who don't settle for um, the first lyric that comes into your head. And someone who's great for that is Fraser T. Smith. He would always push me. Um, I did a lot of sessions with him when I first moved to London. And he would, um, he would tell me constantly that I needed to work on my writing and, and, and push me in that, in that respect. And it really helped. What about in terms of journalists' opinions and critics' opinions of what you do? Do you take it on or just not bothered, really? You know, I, I, take, on, I, I take it on to a certain extent, but um, music is so subjective and everyone has an opinion. And what I've learned so far is if you take on board everyone's opinion, you're just going to go crazy. So I just stay true to who I am and I keep my, my circle close. And I have my people that I go to if I want an opinion on something specifically. And um, yeah, I try and keep myself level-headed. Who are the people that you go to, say, if you've got a song, you want a, an honest opinion? Who is the first person, perhaps, that you go to? Uh, I go to my manager. I go to my friends um, who are constantly online checking out new music. So I know that they're up to date with what's going on. They're up to speed. I, go to my sister she's a very harsh critic of my music she'll say to me I don't like this song or this is my favorite song so she'll always you know be very honest with me and um, my team you know it's important that you have a team that that don't BS with you they just tell you how it is and um, yeah so they're the people you're putting the EP out on Laserwood Records yeah. so did you have to kind of study like the business side of things with your record label to know what you're doing yeah, before I before I um, moved to London, I was mentored by a producer who gave me a lot of books and and used to kind of teach me about the industry and about the um, the infrastructure of the industry and um, and I guess when you're when you're in an environment that's so intense as as the music industry is, you kind of pick things up by talking to different people. So it's been like an ongoing process in terms of educating myself, and I'm still learning. So. I don't think everyone, anyone ever stops. No. What's been the biggest surprise about the process? Something that you didn't realise happened in the industry that other people used to look after? Well, one thing I've realised is just how quickly things can happen if you do them yourself or, and if things are delegated properly. Like when I was in, in a label, things would take a long time to, uh, to move. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's interesting to see how much things cost as well, you know, like putting out your own music, marketing, and there's a, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to be paid for. <laughs> and I know you're really interested in the creative and the visual sides of things, so have you taken on board a lot of that yourself as well to yeah. reduce costs and just for the Definitely. fun? Definitely. I mean, I have a stylist that I work really closely with, um, Soki Mac, she's amazing. She, we're on the same page, so I trust her eye, and, um, and I, keep my, I keep my team tight, and um, we're all growing together, and we're all... We're all working hard to, uh, to lift this project. Do you think you'll feel kind of more proud than you would have if you had been on a label? If things like really explode, you can be like, well, that was all down to me and my, my niche team. Do you think it would be a better accomplishment for you? Um, I don't know if it would be a, a better accomplishment. I think um, whichever way it happens is an accomplishment because even in a label, you still have to do a lot of work yourself. So it's not like you have an easy ride in a label. Um, I just think to be able to uh, to make a living and to uh, to be happy in the music industry is an accomplishment in itself. So it's not hard in 2012, is it? The music industry it's quite a tough place to be. It's I think. a really tough place to be, but there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of determined people out there, myself included, and and barriers are being broken. And so, you know, it's uh, it's not a dead end. You know, it's still an option. It's just a, it's just a tough route. Referring back to your style again, a lot of artists, they, they've got such an outlandish style that it's kind of the thing that people concentrate on the most. How do you strike that balance of being stylish and having an interest but not letting it overshadow what you do? I think that people are not stupid and they can see through a gimmick and, and if you look good then that's great, maybe you should be a model but if you're a musician and your music sucks then people will figure out soon enough that you're just 
visual and not much substance. And me and my manager always say that music saves all. And so uh, every gig that I have, I give it my, my all and make sure that the focus is on the songs rather than just what I look like visually. For you, what is the main draw? Is it being in the studio and writing the songs or is it being on stage and Everything. performing? I love it all. It all, it's, it, I get, um, I get a kick out of writing a song and then hearing it all back in content, in context, and then and then playing it and and then seeing a, a response from it. Everything it, it all counts and it's it's such an amazing process. The whole thing. Because of your genre mix and all the hybrids and stuff, have you started to notice that there is a sort of demographic that you're hitting more, or the people that are coming to your stage look a, a certain way? Is it or is it really mixed? I think um, I think. Just as my music is, uh, it touches on different genres of music, um, I'm able to tap into different fans from different types of music. So um, generally I get a lot of um, people who are into R&B, but still into um, drum and bass as well, because there's still a bit of that in my in my EP and in my set. So it's um, I think the people that will enjoy my gigs are people who like good music, so <laughs> that's yeah. it. We should end on that, really. That's we quite should. a good way to end. Okay, so best of luck. I think it's out Thanks, on the twenty second. Twenty second right? of October. Get it. Three pound forty nine. Absolute bargain. Real music. Thank you very much. Thank nice you. to meet you.